بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد uh, as you know I came back from Hajj my voice is still not fully recovered so I ask for your apologies we are continuing our series about the signs of Judgment Day and I had covered the minor signs in totality for the purposes of our class and I had also given the Friday class about the Mahdi which we said is the linkage between the minor signs and the major signs Today, insha'Allah, in the next few weeks, we will cover the 10 major signs of Judgment Day, one after the other. And we will begin with the one that we know is the first of the 10. And it is also the one that we have the most details about. So we might spend two full lectures on just this first sign. And we'll discuss various opinions and issues and controversies surrounding this first sign. Realize that not all of the ten signs we have as much details. And in fact, some of them are just five minutes, like the three earthquakes. That's all that we know. Three earthquakes. That's it. I've done the three signs right there. Not much is known about those. We can just zoom over them. So not all ten signs we have the same amount of details for. But the first of the ten major signs... And no doubt the most interesting for most Muslims, also the most controversial, is the concept of Dajjal. The concept of Dajjal. And he will be the first of the ten. Why and how do we know this? Because we know that the Masih, the Jesus, the coming of Isa, will be coinciding with the Mahdi. The Mahdi and Isa will be on earth at the same time. We did this last two weeks ago, correct? You guys were here, we did it, right? And we said that the Mahdi, when will the Mahdi die? How will the Mahdi die? What are the details? Guys, help me out. MashaAllah, our young brother says, what does he say? Say it louder. Nothing. What does nothing mean? We don't know. Don't just say nothing. There are no narrations. We don't know. How will the Mahdi die? What will his death be? We do know Isa will live. For a few years and there is no mention of the Mahdi so the assumption is the Mahdi is gone Isa will live and what will Isa do Isa will kill the Dajjal therefore Dajjal Mahdi Isa same time frame so of the ten major signs the first of them without a doubt will be Dajjal is that clear this is how we know the first of the ten and what did our Prophet say when the first of them come the other will come Till one akhar, ba'd al akhar, one after the other, like a domino. Once the first one comes, the other nine will zoom. So we seek Allah's refuge from even seeing the first one. And the first one is the most terrifying of them, and that is Al Masih al Dajjal. So who is Al Masih al Dajjal? What do we know about Al Masih al Dajjal? And this will be a detailed lecture, so we will not, you know, in all likely we will not finish today. We'll have to continue about the Dajjal in next lecture. First and foremost, what is Masih and what is is Dajjal. The word Masaha, Masih, is used for only two people in Islamic literature. Number one, the Masih Isa ibn Maryam, and number two, the Masih ad Dajjal. And in Abrahamic religions, folklore of the Judeo Christian tradition, the both of them they are called the promised Messiah and the false Messiah. So in the Christian literature, you have the true Messiah, and that's Isa ibn Maryam, and you have the false Messiah, or the Antichrist, he's also called. So you have the Christ and the Antichrist. So the concept of there being two paired individuals, Jesus, Anti-Jesus, Masih al-Dajjal and Masih Isa ibn Maryam. This is found in Christian literature and it is found in Islamic literature as well. So the both religious traditions agree on this. As for the Jewish traditions, there is not that much about the Antichrist. In fact, he doesn't seem to play any role. And this is going to come into play. Remember this point, put it in your mind. We're going to come back to this. There doesn't seem to be the figure of the Antichrist. There is only the figure of the Messiah, the Christ. And this is going to come very important in a while. What does Messiah mean? Messiah means to anoint. What does it mean to anoint? In the good old days, when the king became the king, he would be anointed. They would put some holy oil, special oil, and he, they would put it on his forehead, for example. When the prophet became a prophet, 
in the time of the Bani Israel, he would be taken to the river Jordan, or, the, or one of the holy rivers, and he would be anointed with the water. And the concept of baptism comes from this, that he's going to be anointed with the water. That is the anointment, to rub. And that's in Arabic, masaha, which is masih, the one who is rubbed. So masaha in Arabic is, masaha is to rub, masih, the one who is rubbed. Masih, the object that is rubbed. So, Masih Isa is called Masih because John the Baptist, Yahya, was the final person to give him, to give any person this anointment. After Jesus, no one has been anointed by Allah, by the command of Allah, by the barakah of Allah. So Isa is the final one anointed because there were pre pre previous prophets that were anointed but Isa was the special and the final so he is called Al-Masih Isa ibn Maryam so he is the Masih that is Isa as for the Dajjal we do not know who will anoint him definitely not righteous people but most likely his followers will anoint him his followers will appoint him and he will be the false appointed one it is said and there is no explicit evidence about this that perhaps the Yahud who follow him will anoint him thinking he is the real Messiah so they will do the ritual of Jesus but to the Dajjal the ritual that was done to Isa will be given to the wrong one and the people will assume him to be Isa, but he is not Isa, he is Dajjal. So he is going to be the false Messiah, the Antichrist, and that is the Messiah Dajjal. So his title is Messiah. And his noun, not his name, his laqab is a Dajjal. And Dajjal, what does it mean? Dajjal comes from Dajjal. And Dajjala in Arabic means to mix up. It also means to deceive. But not a regular deceit. The worst type of deceit is called Dajjal. There is no English translation for it, right? Deceive, you can deceive your child, you can deceive your spouse, you can deceive. But Dajjala is to mix the worst evil with the most righteous truth. And why is Dajjal called Dajjal? Because he shall mix the worst evil, the worst evil, and he will put it in with the truth. He will say that he is Al Masih Isa ibn Maryam, and this is Dajjal. Because Isa is a righteous man and the Dajjal is an evil man. So he will take an evil, which is that he is a liar. And he will say he is the best of the best and he is Isa ibn Maryam. Even worse than this, he will say, وَالْعِيَاذُ billah That he is Allah himself. And what greater Dajjal, what greater deceit, what greater evil is there than to say that he is Allah. And he will claim that he is being inspired by Allah. So he will claim all of these claims. And by the way, the person from Qadiyan last century, he went through the same things. He first said he is Isa. Then he said he is inspired. Even though as far as I know, he never claimed he is God. But this Dajjal will claim he is God himself. He is Allah himself. So that is why he is called Dajjal. That he is deceiving the people. He is substituting the truth with the uh, falsehood. Because no one will mix truth with falsehood in a more brazen manner, in a more blatant manner than Al-Masih Al-Dajjal. And our Prophet ﷺ predicted that there will be many Dajjals. In an authentic hadith reported in Musad Imam Ahmad and other books, our Prophet ﷺ said, and there is a version of it in Sahih Muslim, our Prophet ﷺ said, there shall be after me, listen to this, 30 Dajjalun Kathabun. 30 Dajjals. All of them Kathab. Kulluhum Yazumu Annahu Nabi. Everyone is claiming that he is a Nabi. Wa Annahu La Nabi Yabadi. And there is no Nabi after me. What do we learn from this hadith? It's not just one Dajjal. There are many, we can call them in English, Dajjal with a small d. Or we can say, mini Dajjals, no problem. But there is one Dajjal with a big D, okay? Or the major Dajjal. So there are many, mini Dajjals. Thalathun in one hadith. Thirty. What is the sign of these false Dajjal? Kulluhum yaz'umu annahu Nabi. Everyone says the same claim. I am Nabi, I am Nabi, I am Nabi. 
And the Prophet said, وَأَنَّهُ لَا نَبِيَّ بَعْدِي From this we learn a principle, my dear brothers and sisters. Anybody who claims he is a Nabi, he is in fact what? A Dajjal. Is that clear? Anybody who claims he is a Nabi, you can call him a title. And that title is, you are a Dajjal. A Dajjal. As for the Dajjal, that will be the last of them. The 30th of them. That is the big Dajjal. That is the worst of them. And before that time, there will be plenty of mini Dajjals. And we had one here in America as well. This Louis Farrakhan. Uh, no, sorry, not Louis Farrakhan. Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad, who, uh, the founder of the Nation of Islam. He claimed that he is Nabi. And he claimed that Allah inspires him. And uh, he claimed openly that I am the prophet of God. He changed his, he was born Elijah Muhammad, Elijah Poole. He changed his name to Elijah Muhammad. And he then said that you have to recite the kalima. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. And by that he meant he is the messenger. He called himself Muhammad. And then he said, whenever a Muslim says Muhammad Rasulullah, that is me. And so he taught to his people this and he is one of the last of the Dajjals to come and Allah knows how many will come until the, the end of times. But we are now interested in the big Dajjal, the final Dajjal. And there are, before we get to the ahadith about Dajjal, there are two interesting aspects that are found in hadith literature that confuse the average reader and in fact they even confuse some of the sahaba so they still remain elements of confusion about the issue of the jal the first of them was that there was an individual who lived at the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam whom even the prophet ﷺ for a period of time didn't know is he that the jal or is he a minor the jal okay he didn't know and this incident is mentioned in Sahih Muslim and many books of hadith. It is an authentic incident. Multiple narrations exist about a certain young man who lived in Medina, who was from one of the Yahudi tribes. And he was a sorcerer. He had a alaqa, a connection with the jinn. He would call the jinn. And he was a magician. And he would pretend he knew the future. And he would foretell the future. You know, in English, we call them a soothsayer. He would foretell the future. And in our religion, anybody who pretends to know the future is a liar. And in our religion, anybody who invokes the jinn and calls out to the jinn, this is a magician. We don't call out to the jinn. We don't do anything for the jinn. And perhaps in another lecture, I'll talk about this reality of how mankind has a relationship with the jinn, which is a very scary and interesting and deep topic. And all of our men and women love talking about the issue of jinn. Jinn stories are swapped at night when the hours become in the wee hours of the night. It becomes common to swap ancient jinn stories. And inshallah, one day I'll give an academic lecture. What is all of this? Is there something called jinn? Is there something called magic? And inshallah, we'll explain at that stage. For now, realize that it is possible for evil people to invoke the jinn. It is possible. And when they do so, this is what we call magic. And that's why magic is haram. It is always haram to invoke the jinn. Because they are wanting nothing but evil. Whoever does so must sacrifice tawheed and get involved in shirk. Because the payments that jinns accept, evil jinns, because you have good jinns as well, the payments that jinns accept is what? Do you think they will accept your American Express? Do they care about dollars and cents? What is the currency you will give the jinn? Your worship. That's the only thing the jinn wants. The jinn doesn't care about your credit score. He doesn't care about your credit cards and your money. What will the jinn do with credit cards and money? What does the jinn want? The same thing he wanted, Iblis wanted. That ana khayrum min. I am better than this creation. Let this creation bow down to me. Let this creation worship me. And if the jinn gets this, in return, the jinn will do some favors for you. Right? We'll go and tell you something that whatever. So we'll talk about it when we get to it. So there was this magician at the time of the Prophet Wasallam by the name of Safi ibn Sayyad. That was his name. 
Safi ibn Sayyad. And some say his name was Abdullah ibn Sayyad, but his name was Safi. Safi ibn Sayyad. And he was from one of the Yahudi tribes who remained living in Medina for a number of years. Not all of the Jewish tribes were expelled. Some small families remained. And he was from of those tribes that lived on the outskirts of Medina. And when our Prophet migrated to Medina, Safi ibn Sayyad was a young child and he was about to reach puberty. And that's when, and so he's around 13 years old. And that's when our Prophet begins interacting with him. And there are a number of interesting narrations about uh, Safi ibn Sayyad. Of them, is that uh, the Prophet wasallam heard that there is this young child who has these visions of the jinn, he predicts the future. And so Umar and the Prophet this hadith is in Sahih Muslim, they walked towards a group of children who were playing and amongst them was Safi ibn Sayyad. And so Ibn, Ibn Sayyad is his name, and that's, he's called in hadith literature Ibn Sayyad. Ibn Sayyad was not aware that the Prophet ﷺ was coming until he was right behind him. And Ibn Sayyad turned around and the Prophet ﷺ was there. So the Prophet ﷺ said to Ibn Sayyad, Do you testify that I am Rasulullah? Do you testify I am Rasulullah? And Ibn Sayyad said, I testify that you are the Rasul of the Ummiyeen in a derogatory manner. You are the Rasul of the unlettered people. You're not Rasul to me, you're Rasul to the unlettered folk. So the Ibn Sayyad then said to the Prophet ﷺ, and he's 12, 13 years old, look, he said, do you testify that I am Rasulullah? What did we say? One of the signs of a Dajjal is what? Dajjal claims he is Rasul. Right? So he is now saying, and look at the arrogance. And this also shows you that this is what happens when you start getting involved in, in magic. You really become a very evil person. How dare in front of the face of the process and you are twisting the question and you're saying, okay, you ask me, now let me ask you, do you testify that I am Rasulullah? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Amantu Billahi wa Rasulihi. I believe in Allah and His Messenger. That was his response. And he said to Ibn Sayyad, what do you see? What do you see? What visions come to you? Ibn Sayyad said, I see two people come to me. One of them tells the truth, one of them tells lies. The Prophet ﷺ said, rather, the matter has been made confusing for you, meaning both of them are telling lies. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, I have a test for you. I have hidden something for you. And what was that thing that he was hiding? He was hiding a verse from the Quran, which is, uh, 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 um, what's the hafid here? Uh, what is it? Yes, what is the beginning of it? My mind is a little bit awkward because of the Hajj. I'm still not fully recovered. Fartaqib yawma ta'ti samaa bi dukhanin mubin. Fartaqib. I'm saying fantadil. Fartaqib yawma ta'ti samaa bi dukhanin mubin. Okay. So the Prophet had recited this verse to the Sahaba, and he's saying, "I'm holding. I'm testing Ibn Sayyad. He says he knows ilm al ghayb he says he knows everything. Okay, I just recited this verse. Let's see, does he know did I recite this verse or not? You see the test, right? And by the way, any person who charges you $5 an hour to predict the future is betraying his own lies when he's forced to charge you $5 to predict the future. If he knew the future, he would be investing in Bitcoin and the stock market and become multimillionaire instantaneously. The fact that he has to charge you $5 to read your hand the fact that you have to call in 399 per minute to predict the future indicates what a liar that person is. Is that clear what I'm saying, right? So the process is testing. This is a man, he is claiming he knows ilm al ghaib. He knows everything. Okay, I just recited a verse 20 feet away from him. Let's see whether he can tell his followers what I just recited to all of you. Simple test. Right? فَرْتَقِبْ يَوْمَ تَأْتِ السَّمَاءُ بِدُخَانٍ مُبِينٍ He had recited to Umar ibn Khattab. Now he goes to Ibn Sayyad and he says to Ibn Sayyad, I have a test for you. Do you know what it is? Do you know what I have hidden for you? And this shows you, Ibn Sayyad did have contact with the jinn, but the jinn are not all knowledgeable. All he could say was, دُخْ 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 And the verse was, فَرْتَقِبْ Right? فَرْتَقِبْ يَوْمَ تَأْتِسْمَا بِدُخَانٍ مُبِينٍ And the jinn narrated two letters. دُخْ 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 
and not the whole verse. The whole verse. You see that, right? So there was some jinn that was communicating with Ibn Sayyad, and he wasn't able to do it. So the Prophet said, Ikhsa ya adu wallah. And Ikhsa literally translates as shut up. It is a harsh word. Ikhsa, the English word is shut up. And the Prophet was never harsh except to those who deserved it. Ikhsa ya adu wallah. Shut up, O enemy of Allah. Falan ta'adu wa qadrak. You shall never go beyond your meagerness. You think you are so big, you're never going to go beyond this. Umar ibn Khattab said, Ya Rasulullah, allow me to execute him. This is a, a, a Dajjal. He says he is Rasulullah. He's communication with the jinn. His penalty is execution. Ya Rasulullah, allow me to execute him. And our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, If he is that Dajjal, you shall not be able to kill him. And if he is other than that Dajjal, your killing won't benefit anyone. He's nothing. It's going to go away. Right? Leave him be. Now, this hadith is in Sahih Muslim, it's authentic. Now, if he is that Dajjal, you shall not be able to kill him. Why? Because who shall kill that Dajjal? Isa alayhi salam. No one will be able to kill that one. So the Prophet is telling Umar, if he is that Dajjal, you won't be able to kill him. And if he is other than that Dajjal, yeah, what's the big deal? He's going to come and go, no one will care. Your killing will not harm any or benefit anyone. He's going to be a minor, which was the case. He became a footnote in history. Majority of Muslims don't even know about his name, even though during the time of the Sahaba, he was somewhat of a big deal. Somewhat. In the sense, we don't know his state, as we're going, as we're going to uh, come to. So this is one hadith about Ibn Dajjal. Another hadith, uh, sorry, Ibn Sayyad, sorry. Another hadith is that once the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to go test Ibn Sayyad went to go test Ibn Sayyad and he walked towards his house with some of the Sahaba and he hid behind some date palms trying to see uh, Ibn Sayyad uh, in a way that Ibn Sayyad would not see him. But Ibn Sayyad's mother saw the Prophet in the distance. So she shouted out, Ya Safi, O Safi, watch, be careful. His mother was on the side of, obviously, the mothers typically side with their sons. Even in Batil, unfortunately, this is human nature. So the mother is saying to Ibn Sayyad, Ya Safi, that's his name, or Ya Saf. She cut out the Ya, uh, out of love, it's called in Arabic, So they say, Ya Saf, look, there is Muhammad, Rasulullah So he turned around and he saw the Prophet ﷺ, and there was again some conversation that did not result in anything uh, fruitful per se. And that Ibn Sayyad, he continued to live in Medina after the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he resided in Medina and a number of Sahaba swore by Allah that that is the Dajjal and they considered Ibn Sayyad to be that Dajjal and of them was Umar ibn Khattab he would make halaf with Allah that that is the Dajjal also Jabir ibn Abdullah the famous Sahabi, he felt that that is the actual uh, Dajjal. And a number of other famous uh, Sahaba. Nafi' said that I heard my master Ibn Umar, uh, Ibn Umar is, is of course the son of Abdullah of, of Umar al-Khattab. So Umar and his son Abdullah ibn Umar, obviously the same family, they both thought Ibn Sayyad is that uh, Dajjal. Nafi' is the famous slave of Ibn Umar, who was freed by Ibn Umar, and he became a great scholar, and Ibn Umar died and Nafir became the Shaykh of Medina and Malik Ibn Anas came studied with Nafir and so the golden chain which you should all know Malik Ibn Anas from Nafir from Ibn Umar this is one of the most famous Isnads of Islamic history and Nafir was nothing other than a servant a slave whom Allah honored with knowledge this is what knowledge does he was purchased as a young child as a slave but he was eager for Islam he memorized the Quran he memorized hadith and therefore every book of hadith has Malik from Nafir from Ibn Umar so Nafir said I heard my master Ibn Umar say Wallahi I have no doubt that Masih al-Dajjal is Ibn Sayyad he's making halaf because he heard it from his father so Umar and his son Ibn Umar they felt that Ibn Sayyad is none other than that al-Dajjal and there's a famous narration as well that is mentioned in Sahih Muslim that once Ibn Umar met Ibn Sayyad in the streets of Medina and he had a fight with him, verbal fight. And he made Ibn Sayyad very angry. 
and Ibn Sayyad walked away stomping, very angry. So Ibn Umar then visited the house of his sister Hafsa, our mother Hafsa. And Hafsa heard the news that Ibn Umar and Ibn Sayyad had a confrontation in the bazaar, in the public sphere of Medina. This is after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. The news spread that Ibn Sayyad and Ibn Umar, they had it out. They were shouting and screaming. Ibn Sayyad left stomping and angry. Hafsa said to her brother that, what is the matter with you? And Ibn Sayyad, why do you have to interfere with him? Why are you getting involved in this issue? Don't you know that the Prophet ﷺ said, so this is a hadith now, that the Dajjal shall come and appear after something has caused him to become angry? Meaning, why are you poking him? Why are you prodding him? Why are you getting him angry? What is your business with the man? Let him be. We don't want the Dajjal to come when he's alive. Which means even Hafsa might have been sympathetic that Ibn Sayyad is who? Is that Dajjal? And that's one family, Hafsa, Ibn Umar, Umar. They're one family, and they thought that Ibn Sayyad is the actual, is the actual uh, Dajjal. Now, this, uh, this uh, issue of Ibn Sayyad being the Dajjal was denied by other Sahaba. And the most famous narration we have in this regard, which is one that is somewhat funny and somewhat sad at the same time, and this is also in Sahih Muslim. Imam Muslim, by the way, he made a section in his Sahih about the Ahadith of Ibn Sayyad. So if any of you want to study Ibn Sayyad, you can go to Sahih Muslim. It is translated in English. I'm sure there are many Urdu translations and you will find an entire section about the Ahadith of Ibn Sayyad. And now with this commentary of mine, you can now approach this section because without commentary, it's very confusing. And you can read all of these half a dozen narrations about Ibn Sayyad in Sahih Muslim. So, a very sad and funny and humorous and interesting narration Ibn Muslim uh, in Sahih Muslim as well is narrated by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu ta'ala an. He says that one time I was doing Hajj or Umrah, the narrator forgot what he said, with Ibn Sayyad. And the time came for the caravan to stop. So you know, the caravans go for five, ten hours, they stop for the night, next morning they'll go. So the time came to stop. And when the caravans basically stopped, everybody ran away from Ibn Sayyad, and I was the one left next to him. Right? So nobody wanted to be put his tent next to the tent of Ibn Sayyad. Okay? Everybody goes away, and I found myself next to Ibn Sayyad. And I became very terrified of him because of the rumors going around about him. This is after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. Still the rumors are there. Abu Sa'id wants nothing to do with the guy. And looking around, he saw I was the only camel there. So he brought his belongings and he sat down next to me. I said to him, it is so hot over here. Maybe it's better for you if you rest in that shade over there. Just get away from me, okay? So he got the hint, he stood up, and he went over there. And eventually some meat came to uh, me. So Ibn Sayyad stood up to share with that meat. So now food has come. And generally speaking, when you're in one caravan, you're going to all share the meal, okay? Nobody wanted to deliver the meal to him, so they delivered it to Abu Sa'id al-Khudri and Ibn Sayyad wants to now share that meal. So he came and he sat down with me and he had a glass of milk with him. So he gave me some milk and he said, go ahead, take some. So I said, this milk is warm and I don't like warm milk. And the only reason I didn't want to drink it, this is him saying, is because I did not want to touch anything he touched. Okay, who refuses milk in those days? Everybody loves milk. But Ibn Sayyad, he goes, I don't want it. So Ibn Sayyad said, Ya Aba Sa'id, how I wish that I could take a rope and tie it on that tree and commit suicide because of what the people say about me. In other words, he knows exactly why Abu Sa'id is not sitting next to him, is not sharing the milk with him, and is hurting Ibn Sayyad. How I wish that I can take a rope, tie it on that tree, and then commit suicide because of that, because of what the people say about me. Ya Abu Sa'id, 
Don't you know from being from the Ansar what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said? Ya Aba Sa'id, aren't you one of the most knowledgeable people about the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Ya Aba Sa'id, look, he is now quizzing him. Don't you know that the Dajjal is a kafir and I am a Muslim? Ya Aba Sa'id, don't you know that the Dajjal shall have no children and I have left my children in Medina. By the way, these are all signs. Dajjal, we all know he's a kafir. Dajjal shall have no children. And Ibn Sayyad said, I left my family in Medina. How can I be Dajjal? Ya Aba Sa'id, don't you know that Dajjal shall not enter Mecca and Medina? And here I am having left Medina on our way to Mecca. Now he's giving some solid points here, right? How are you going to refute this? Okay. By the way, so another thing about Dajjal, we're going to come to these. One of the signs of Dajjal is he shall not enter Mecca or Medina. And Ibn Sayyad is living in Medina and he's on his mate way to uh, Mecca. And Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said, he continued making these arguments until I was about to have a soft spot for him. Then what happened? Then he said, أَمَا وَاللَّهِ إِنِّي لَأَعْرِفُهُ وَأَعْرِفُ مَوْلِدَهُ وَأَيْنَ هُوَ الْآنِ But by Allah, this is Ibn Sayyad saying to Abu Sayyid al-Khudri, I know who the Dajjal is. And I know where he shall be born. And I know who his parents are in one version. And I know where he is now. That throws a spanner in all of this. How do you know all of this, O oh, Ibn Sayyad? How do you know all of this? So Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, after having his heart softened, feeling guilty, maybe in doing the guy wrong, now, for sure his face must have changed when he said, but I know who he is and I know where he is. All of a sudden the terror comes back to Abu Sa'id al-Khudri and he says, may you be cursed, Ya Ibn Sayyad, for what you have done. And he walks away. So Ibn Sayyad is no joke. There was some murkiness about him about who he was. However, eventually Ibn Sayyad simply disappears. We don't know when he died. The hadith goes that on the day of Harra, he was just disappeared. Nobody knows basically how he died. But clearly Ibn Sayyad was not that Dajjal because he himself gave all of these signs that Abu Sa'id al-Khudri had to acknowledge. Whether he died a Muslim or not is another issue because Ibn Sayyad is saying, I am a Muslim and the Dajjal is a Kafir. And this has caused a huge controversy amongst the scholars. And Imam al-Zahabi in his monumental encyclopedia of the uh, Sahaba, uh, he basically says that he cannot be a Sahabi because, and this is a very interesting point, what is the definition of a Sahabi? A Sahabi is someone whom the Prophet interacted with while that person was a Muslim. If the interaction occurred and the person was not a Muslim and later embraced Islam, that person does not become a Sahabi. And of the examples or the possible examples is Ibn Sayyad. Ibn Sayyad did not accept Islam in the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If he accepted Islam, and that is an if we don't know. If he accepted Islam after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu this does not make him a Sahabi, it makes him a Tabi'i. Another interesting twist, not as big of a twist, but it is nonetheless interesting. Another interesting twist is that the son of Ibn Sayyad, the son of Ibn Say Sayyad became a great scholar. And his name is Umara ibn Sayyaf ibn Sayyad, right? Uh, ibn Safi ibn Sayyad. So Umara ibn Safi ibn Sayyad. And this same Umara is one of the teachers of Imam Malik, believe it or not. So, one of the, and, and his name is found in the Muatta and others as a narrator of hadith. And this is the son of Ibn Sayyad. And he is a narrator of hadith and he is a famous narrator of hadith. And it is said that Imam Malik respected Umara immensely because of his knowledge of hadith. Okay, so one of those interesting twists. The bottom line, in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, there was a cryptic figure who was a minor Dajjal in that time frame. And because he was still a young child, the Prophet ﷺ did not know, is he going to grow up to become that Dajjal or not? And the Prophet ﷺ passes away, and that confusion lingers on in the Sahaba. 
Some of them still think he is the Dajjal. But we now know that he could not have been that Dajjal. Now it is clear he wasn't that Dajjal. And so you should be aware of that controversy that Ibn Sayyad was one of the minor Dajjals. Now, did he embrace Islam or not? Allah knows best. But this last phrase that he said to Abu Sa'id al-Khudri really throws a spanner. Means he still had contact with the world of the jinn. And he still has some issues that are un-Islamic. So he, he dies in murky circumstances and we leave his affair to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the first uh, interesting controversy about Dajjal. There is another one before we get to other hadith. So all of these are interesting things that you should be aware of now. And this is inshallah, inshallah this is an advanced series of lectures. Otherwise you will not hear much of this stuff in the English language. Now the rest, the next incident of Dajjal. And you will also find this hadith in Sahih Muslim. Is the famous narration that might seem to indicate that the Dajjal is alive and healthy as we speak and that he is chained up in some exotic island maybe in the Bermuda Triangle Allah knows best I'm just making that up uh, what is this hadith and where do we get it from this hadith is the famous hadith of Fatima bint Qais one of the famous Sahabiyat she narrates, and this hadith is in Sahih Muslim, that one day we were sitting in our house when we heard the crier running through the city saying, As-salatu jami'ah, as-salatu jami'ah. As-salatu jami'ah is how the Prophet ﷺ would call the Sahaba to the masjid when there was an issue other than the five salawats. The adhan is not given. You have an announcement. Come to the musalla, come to the musalla. That's how they would do that. As-salatu jami'ah simply means come to the musalla. That's what it means now. Even though it technically means yani, come and pray, but the meaning here is come to the masjid. So, Fatima says, I rushed to the masjid to see what was happening. And I prayed with the Prophet ﷺ. And I was in the first line of the women, right behind the men. In her eagerness to hear what the Prophet ﷺ would say, she was in the first saf of the women behind the men. The point she's trying to say is, I heard directly everything that I'm about to tell you. So after we finished praying, the Prophet ﷺ went on the mimbar and sat down. And he said, let everybody remain where he is. Nobody move. Let everybody remain where he is. Do you know why I called you? They said, Allah and His Messenger know best. He said, I did not call you today to give you an advice or a lecture to cause you to cry or to fear Allah. That's not the reason. Mo'idah, no khatira today. I didn't call you. But rather, I came to tell you what Tamim Ad-Dari came to inform me. Tamim Ad-Dari. Who is Tamim Ad-Dari? I have a lecture about him online very briefly about one of the, you know, my series about the Sahaba. Tamim Ad-Dari was one of the few Sahabi who was a Christian and then embraced Islam. The majority of Sahaba were pagans very very few were jewish or christian when they embraced islam very few and of them is tamim al-dari so he's one of those group of sahaba who was ahli kitab and he embraces islam and of them is tamim al-dari and so tamim al-dari came to me embracing islam and he told me a story that happened to him many many years ago now tamim al-dari is from one of the tribes up north and those tribes were seafaring tribes. They would ride the ocean. The Quraysh were a non-seafaring tribe. The Quraysh despised the ocean. The Quraysh did not like riding on the ocean. And that's why the Quran is full of references. The Quraysh did not like the ocean. And few of the Qurayshis rode on the ocean. And that's why when our Prophet saw a dream when some of his own Sahaba were riding the oceans, conquering other lands, he laughed and he said, I saw my own ummah shall be riding on the waves like kings riding horses and steeds galloping and they shall be conquering, you know, uh, oceans. And uh, Umm Milhan said, Ya Rasulullah, make dua that I am amongst them. And he said, you are amongst them. And that's why she died in Qubros, in Cyprus, because the Prophet said, you will be amongst them. So he laughed when he saw his ummah riding the ocean. It was a strange thing for the Quraysh. They did not like. Unlike Tamim al-Dari, they were seafarers. They were people who were involved in navy issues. And so, naval issues, naval expeditions. And so, Tamim al-Dari, he came to embrace Islam. And he came in the ninth year of the Hijrah. And he came to 
Del you know, in those days, they sent the delegations to embrace Islam. And when he came, he told the Prophet Sallallahu about something that happened to him many, many, many years ago. He said, Ya Rasulullah, ya Rasulullah let me tell you an interesting story. Let me tell you something that when I was an earlier young man, a Christian, this is what happened to me. So when he told this story, the Prophet Sallallahu then called the Sahaba and said, Here is Tamim al Dadi, let me tell you what he told me. That's the hadith here. Okay? Now, it's a very long hadith. And you will find it. Where will you find it, guys? Online. Online? I gave you the reference right now. Sahih Muslim. Sahih Muslim. Okay? And by the way, I would want you to start getting connected with our traditions. Uh, it's a side note here. SubhanAllah, we have... Some of us have a fear to touch Sahih Bukhari. Sahih Muslim. My dear brothers and sisters, these are our sources. Learn to familiarize. It's not going to bite you. It's not going to bite you. You don't have to have wudu to touch Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. Okay? Purchase these books. Wallahi, you will start, your horizons will start broadening. You're going to start feeling a sense of knowledge. Oh, this is what the book says. If you have any questions, come to me, come to any scholar. You will find, inshallah, an answers, no problem. But why are you scared of reading hadith? Why are you scared of getting into the tradition? I'm telling you, Imam Muslim has an entire section about Dajjal and about Ibn Sayyad and about all of these hadith. Read all of these. And after this brief explanation of just 20 minutes, you will yourself see, oh my God, this makes sense, this makes sense, this makes sense. That's all that's needed. And your iman will grow and your love for hadith will increase and your love for the Prophet will increase. So I encourage you all, don't be scared by opening up a book. Okay, don't be scared to open up a chapter and read and see what is going on. And then if you have any questions, ask. But your iman will increase and also you'll get a sense of knowledge as well. Subhanallah, again all of this is a tangent here. But a lot of times we don't even know why we know, how we know. We don't know where it's found. We don't know. We just, we heard people say, learn your religion from the sources. Is there any harm in that? Learn your religion, read the Qur'an, read the Sunnah, and most importantly, Bukhari and Muslim, they're right there. I strongly encourage you, don't be intimidated by Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim. I'm not saying become a scholar, I'm not saying derive, I'm not saying that, astaghfirullah. I'm not saying open up and become Shaykh al-Islam after one hour. But I'm saying, you don't lose anything reading. Don't lose anything understanding and then asking when you have any issues. So, this hadith is a long one. It's actually four or five pages of English. I'm not going to go into all of that. But in a nutshell, you've all heard of it somehow here and there. Most of you, I should say, have heard of it. And the story goes as follows that Tamim al says when he was a younger man that he was in a ship of around 30 people from the tribe of Judam and Lucham. These are Christian Arab tribes up north and he was from those tribes. And once a, a, a very severe storm came in the ocean and for 30 days they were lost at sea. After there were 30 days they were lost at sea. They had no clue where they were until they came to a far away you know, ocean that they could not recognize and they saw an island in the distance. So some of them, Tamim and Daddy and a few of them took the smaller boat to go get some water, to go get some food. So you know every large boat has that small boat to go in. So they took that smaller boat to go to that island. And when they landed on that island, they met a very terrifying animal, a beast that could speak to them, a dabba that could speak to them. And we'll mention the dabba when we come to one of the ten signs. The dabba that could come to them. And this beast was unrecognizable. Like, you know, call him what, Danny? Um, Bigfoot or something, you know, Frankenstein, whatever. Not Frankenstein, sorry, scratch that from the record. Bigfoot, not Frankenstein. I guess in our cultural folklore, closer to the Bigfoot. Although the hadith did not describe him. It simply says, a beast that's very hairy. Just nothing but hair and could speak. And Tamim saw this and his people and they were terrified. And the beast said, come with me. I'm going to take you to my owner or my master. And they, they went uh, to this island and they went to this cave where they saw a, a man larger than any man they have ever seen. And the man was tied up in a more severe manner than any man they have ever seen. And the man then began to ask a number of questions. And it goes like, you know, 10 questions or so. I'm not going to go to all of them. And they were so terrified, they just responded one after the other. And until in the end, the last question was, 
I mean, of the questions, the, the Tabariya Sea, is it still there? This well, is it giving water? This land, is it still cultivated? And they answered, yes, yes, yes. And always the answer was, a time will come when there shall be no water in that lake. A time will come when this well will be dry. A time will come when this land that you consider to be very beautiful and green will be completely barren. So he's giving predictions in the future. Then he says that, has the Ummi Prophet been sent amongst the Arabs? Has that Prophet been sent amongst the Arabs? And Tamim al dari at this time was a Christian, but he was an Arab. He knows the Prophet has come. So he says, yes, he has been sent. And he has come out from Mecca and he has settled in Yathrib. Because he didn't call it Medina, because only Muslims called it Medina. For those 10 years when Islam was spreading, Yathrib and Medina were the same name, as you know, the same city. And the Muslims called it Medina. And the Munafiqun and the pagans called it the old name, Yathrib. And uh, that is why we are not allowed as Muslims to call it Yathrib unless we describe it, that this is the pre-Islamic uh, name. Uh, in any case, so, because the Prophet said, they call it Yathrib and it is Medina. They call it Yathrib, so we do not call it Yathrib as a name. In any case, so Tamim al dadi said he has settled in Medina. The Dajjal says, did the Arabs fight him? They say, yes. So he says, who won? They say, sometimes he wins and sometimes the Arabs win, meaning the Uhud. Uhud, they say, was a loss, even though Uhud was not a loss. From our perspective, Uhud was a stalemate. It was not a loss, but the Quraysh interpreted as a loss. Dajjal then said, if there is good in the Arabs, they should follow him. And I will tell you about me. I am the Messiah. And it is only a matter of time before I am let loose. And when I am let loose, I shall visit every single city on earth in 40 days, except for Mecca and Medina, for they are made haram for me. Every time I come to them, the angels will uh, stop me. Then, the Prophet ﷺ stopped his lecture and he began and he began uh, poking on the mimbar like this to emphasize. And he said, This is Tiba, this is Tiba, this is Tiba. Did I not tell you about the Dajjal? And they said, Yes, you did. Now this hadith ends over here. Now, this hadith is the famous hadith of Tamim al Dari. Narrated by one Sahabiya Fatima binti Qais. And it is in Sahih Muslim. And its chain appears to be authentic. Now, this hadith has caused... This hadith has caused a lot of controversy in the ummah. Why and how? Because it throws a spanner in what we seem to know about the Dajjal. Other traditions mention that the Dajjal will come towards the end of times. They mention he shall be born to a parents who were childless for many, many years and they're making dua for a child and they shall be given a child and they will not recognize that it is the Dajjal. The hadith that we just mentioned about Hafsa says that the Dajjal will come out and appear because of some anger issue. Something happened that made him angry. Whereas this hadith seems to throw all of that to the wind. And that the Dajjal is alive and healthy, he's tied up, he knows he's the Dajjal, etc., etc. And because of this, this leads us to a very deep issue. Is it allowed to problematize hadith based upon the content and not based upon the chain? You understand this question? Is it allowed for scholars, not from, not talking to average person, for scholars who understand, hadith scholars, to problematize a hadith because the content seems different. And the vast majority of scholars said no. And for good reason. Because if you open this door, then it will never be shut. If you open this door, then every Tom, Dick and Harry or I should say, Tahir, Dawood, and Harun will come and say, oh, I don't understand this hadith. As we have people in our times, Munkiri hadith as we know, right? You know, I'm not going to mention this, but there are people that deny hadith in our times and whatnot. And we are, alhamdulillah, ahl sunnah wal jama'ah. And the meaning of sunni or ahl sunnah means what? We follow sunnah. 
the term Sunni, what does it mean? We are defined by our clinging to the Sunnah. By definition, anybody who says they're Sunni means what? We're following the Sunnah. Anybody says we don't follow the Sunnah, they are from another firqa. Go ahead and call yourself another firqa. You are no longer mainstream. You are no longer Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. So, anyway, what was, I, what was I saying? Is it allowed to problematize hadith based upon the content? The vast majority of scholars said no. A very small handful said yes with a lot of conditions. And this is not the time to go into that. But one of those conditions, and I like this, one of those conditions is the problematization should not come from your mind or logic or rationality. It should come because it seems to be clashing with other ahadith. You understand this point, right? If the problem seems to come with a clash from within the tradition, that is different than when you say, oh, my mind doesn't understand the hadith. Because if you open this door, then out the window. As Ali radiallahu anhu said, that if the hadith or if the aql, or sorry, if the sharia were to be based on my aql, the masah over the socks should be done on the bottom. But I saw with my eyes the Prophet ﷺ do masah on the top. Memorize this, a very beautiful tradition by the way, very beautiful tradition. If our religion were to be based on what I think, on my aql, on my common sense, then when you do masah, where should you do masah? On the bottom. But Ali radiallahu an said, I saw the process and do masah on the top. When it comes to the deen, qala Allahu qala rasuluhu. Sami'na wa ata'na. Whether we understand or not. But what about if within the deen itself, you have two, three hadith that seem to clash? In this case, it's not my mind. We have to now reconcile between this. So, based on this issue, we have some great ulama from the past and from the present, they did problematize this particular hadith. They did problematize this particular hadith. And of them, we have uh, in our times as well, uh, or I should say the generation before us, the famous scholar, the most famous alim of a hundred years ago, and that is Sheikh Rashid Ridha. Sheikh Rashid Ridha. Maybe one day we'll give a lecture about him. Very, very influential alim. And frankly... I'll say something. Many of us here today are influenced by him and we don't even know it. His influence was so profound that he had an impact on a, the global understanding of Islam. And many of us, we don't even know, but we're influenced by him. He was without a doubt the most famous alim of a hundred years ago, Rashid Rida. And unfortunately, his name is not. There was no alim more famous than him 100 years ago. He died 1935, by the way. So in 1919, every intellectual in the ummah knew him. And he influenced people as diverse as Hassan al-Banna and al-Albani. Both of them, they considered Rashid Rada to be their sheikh directly, by the way. Look, he influenced men, and including not just him, but anyway, I'm going to my tangent, but even what we now call modernist Islam, progressive Islam, they take yani, their, uh, yani, in our American system, again, I don't mind saying this, great thinkers like the Hathut brothers and whatnot, they, you know, the trends that were there, they were influenced by Rashid Rida as well. Their sheikh was the student of Rashid Rida. The whole, diver anyway, why am I talking about this? this the Jal. My mind goes here and there. I apologize. You guys don't know me yet, but my mind doesn't. It's not make dua for Sirat al-Mustaqim. I need to be need to be straight here. Where was I? We're talking about the Jal, and what were we talking about before this? Huh? Problematizing it exactly. So Rashid Rida was one of those who said that this hadith doesn't make sense in light of all of these other hadith. And Rashid Rida is a great Sunni alim. He's not one of these. You know, now another great Sheikh as well in our times. My teacher, I studied with him, Sheikh Muhammad ibn Saleh Uthaymeen, very mainstream, very traditional, very hardcore Sheikh who loved hadith. But he said, This hadith, I don't consider it authentic, even if it is in Sahih Muslim. Why? Because it seems to conflict with other hadith. So in reality, I have to be honest, I am sympathetic to this minority voice. Because it doesn't make sense that the Dajjal is alive and healthy. And it also doesn't make sense that if this incident occurred, 
Only Fatima binti Qais narrates it and the Prophet has called the entire city. Something doesn't seem to be right and Allah knows best. Our Shaykh would say, my heart is at unease with regards to the authenticity of this hadith. This is what Ibn Uthameen would say. Fil minhu shay. My heart is not comfortable. Something doesn't make sense to me. I can't pinpoint it, but it's not adding up to me. The content, the isna, everything, it's just not adding up. And mashallah, our shaykh was a very humble man. He would say, but if the Prophet said it, then I believe in it. And this is exactly what I say. The hadith doesn't seem to make sense. But if he said it, amantu billahi wa rasuli. Simple as that. So we put this hadith of, which hadith guys? Tamim al-Dari. In a footnote. And we have a question mark. And we leave it at that. Allah knows best. I don't know. But mainstream interpretation, mainstream interpretation, Imam al nawi Ibn Kathir, these scholars, they consider this to be authentic because this is Sahih Muslim. Then the issue comes, how do you reconcile this with the other ahadith about the coming of Dajjal, shall be born at a later time, his parents shall be childless, etc., etc. And you have one of two opinions. The first of them is that time and space mean nothing to Allah. And so, Tamim al-Dari got lost in, let me speak in the language of Star Trek, and I'm a big fan of Star Trek when I was a child. They got last, lost in a different time warp. And so they traveled to a different time and place, and Allah is ala kulli shayin qadir. And they saw an image of Dajjal projected from the future back to their time frame. And Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. Okay, fair enough. And the other interpretation is that the Jal is in fact alive and healthy and that he was born and all of this happened in the past and then he is being chained and kept as the hadith of Tamim says and he shall be released in the future. Now the issue comes, the only hadith that mentions alive and healthy and chains is this one hadith of Tamim al dari That's it. Every other hadith gives a different narrative. So you have two different narratives. Can we reconcile the two? Most scholars try to do that, but it's a very difficult fit. And that's why Shaykh Rashid Rida and uh, uh, Ibn Uthim and others, they basically said, look, this one, you know, you have a big, beautiful puzzle, right? You have one piece, it's just not fitting in. And the puzzle seems complete. And yet you have in the box this piece. So you can say, maybe the manufacturers put this by accident. I'm being an analogous here, right? Maybe this piece shouldn't have been in the box. It's just a mistake by one of the narrators. That's what they're saying. And the picture is complete. And the other scholars say, no, it's in the box. The, the producer, not the producer, the manufacturer sent it, so I'm going to squeeze it in. There's a little space here. Let me just put it in and shove it there. And khalas, we have a painting. Which version do you want to follow? I leave it to you. But my sympathies are clear. And I leave it to you, whichever one you want to, you want to do. Jayid. So these are two big, important, standard controversies that every advanced student of knowledge is aware of. Number one, the issue of Ibn Sayyad went over him. And uh, Ibn Taymiyyah as well mentions the issue of Ibn, Tayyad, uh, Ibn Sayyad, by the way. And he said that, uh, Ibn, that Ibn Sayyad was one of the minor Dajjals, I forgot to mention. And the major Dajjal is going to um, come. And the issue of Tamim al-Dari and uh, seeing this image on the island. Where is this island? And I explained to you the controversy there. Jayid. With these controversies, we have around 10 minutes left. I'll mention some of the hadith about the Dajjal and then inshallah we'll resume next Wednesday. Inshallah ta'ala. Uh, with these controversies done, we now move on to what do the rest of the hadith mention about the Dajjal? And I'm not going to go over them one by one because it's a bit too advanced for them. I'm just going to summarize for you. Of the things that are mentioned in authentic ahadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, every single Rasul has warned his ummah about Dajjal from the time of Nuh alayhi salam. And I too shall warn you about the Dajjal. Now, this is actually very interesting for us as Muslims. Why? The Prophet ﷺ is saying the concept of the Dajjal is found in all previous traditions. And guess what? We find it 
very clearly in the Christian tradition. As for the Jewish tradition, I have just scratched the surface. I'm not an expert, but I did my research. It appears that they don't really have this concept of the false Jesus. But believe it or not, some sects of the Jews have the concept of the false David, Hajibullah, the false Dawood. And Allah knows best, but it appears to be that because they took David as their main figure, and the folklore remains about the false one coming, so they took their main figure, David, and they made a contrary figure of him. There shall be a false king, David, and Allah knows best. And this is a small segment of the Yahud. And by the way, the vast majority of modern Jews, they have abandoned these types of tales. They no longer believe in this anyway, as you know. The vast majority of them, they just look at these as folkloric traditions. And in fact, many of them don't even consider their law binding anymore, as you know. They are what they call modern modern or reform uh, uh, Jews and that's a whole different that's the majority of American Jews you should all know this another tangent but this is known you should know this as American Muslims you should know there are three main firqas of Yehud of Jews in America number one number one that's the smallest you want to begin with the smallest no, no problem orthodox this is the smallest maybe 10 to 15 percent and they are the strictest and they are the literalists and they want the ones who you can, you know, and they have many firaq as well, and they have the Hasidics and whatnot. Number two is conservative, maybe around 20 25 percent, the next larger. But the majority are number three, reform. And reform essentially, there is no aqidah they have to believe in at all, and there is no sharia they have to follow. They are more of a civilization. So, what I'm saying, one group says the false King David, this is one group of the Orthodox, very, very, very small percentage. Majority of them, these are just folklore tales they don't care about. It's gone. But my point is interesting here. The concept of the false Messiah or the false David is there amongst one group. Where did it come from? The Prophet said, every prophet warned. So we believe the Prophet Musa would have warned. We believe this. That remained. And it was then taken by some group and converted this way. As for mainstream Christians, Baptist Christians, evangelical Christians, most mainline Protestant Christians, they firmly believe in the figure of the Antichrist. They call him the Antichrist. And they believe in this thing called the beast. And they say the symbol of the beast is 666. So these are interesting for us as Muslims. Now, you have two ways of looking at it. If you're a complete secular atheist who doesn't believe in God and whatnot, you say, oh, look at these religions. Their folklore is the same. Their mythology is the same. The Antichrist, the Antichrist, six sixes, the beast, whatnot. Or you can flip it around exactly and say the very fact that two different civilizations and two different faith traditions that have no causal relationship with one another are saying the exact same thing means there must be a common origin and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, you can look at the two exact same things and then figure out what you want to do. Same thing goes for the great flood. Again, a bit of a tangent, but again, this all interesting stuff. Do you know, my dear brothers and sisters, that every single civilization in the world has the myth of a great flood? The native Indians in this land, they have a myth of a great flood that took place once upon a time. The Aborigines in Australia, and they are the most disconnected of humanity. For 20,000 years, they lived separate from the rest of humanity until Cook discovered them in 17... 53 when he whatever did the coast of whatever Australia and he discovered them for 20,000 years the aborigines were cut off from the rest of mankind and guess what they have the myth of a great flood the bible has the great flood the quran has the flood right the uh, origin stories of ancient babylon have the great flood now what is the secular skeptic say ha look at these mythologies they're all the same you can flip it around 180 and say what? Why do all of these civilizations have a great flood myth? Because there was a great flood. And all of these are coming from the great flood. You see what I'm saying here, right? Yani the glass is half full, half empty. 
The same thing can be flipped around and rather than deny faith, you can say, but it makes sense therefore. How could the Aborigines and the native Indians both have the great flood myth? How is that even possible? Think about it. Now true, the details are very different, right? But that's because when you pass a fact from one person to one person to one person, what happens, right? You can even try it at home. Get 10 people, right? To stand together and just do it. And you will be shocked at what you see. Even hadith narrators might find themselves to be weak. Wallahi billah. Allah musta'an. Internal joke. Um, so, where was I? The great flood myth. Hmm? <laughs> You're all lost. <laughs> I apologize for drowning you in all of this great flood myth. Something about the jal. Let's get back to the jal. The notion that every single civilization, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, it has some notion of an evil entity that shall deceive mankind towards the end of times. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it something that makes you think, right? And there are so many, you know, these, these folkloric movies that are made by Hollywood, right? That, you know, the Antichrist is going to come. You know, there's many of these. It's in their psyche. It's in their civilization and culture. Rather than flip it around and say, oh, mythology, we say there is a common origin. So our Prophet ﷺ said, every prophet has warned his ummah about the Dajjal from the time of Nuh salam. He also told us that I shall tell you something that nobody has told before me. So he's going to give a, an interesting fact that no prophet before has mentioned. Now, by the way, I find it interesting personally that if you look at the folklore of the non-Muslims, the Christians, they also have in their folklore that the Dajjal shall be born to a family that is righteous overall and is praying for a child for a long time and that the child will come and will flip on the parents. This is something in their folklore. We find it in our traditions as well. Okay? Um, and one thing we do not find in Christian folklore at all, in Jewish folklore, is that the Dajjal will be deformed. And what do we find in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim? The Prophet is saying, I will tell you something that no other Prophet told his people. That the Dajjal will be deformed. Subhanallah. Look. Do you, see, do you guys understand what I'm saying here? You guys understand what I'm saying? Certain issues of the Judeo-Christian folklore matches with ours. This one thing that the Prophet ﷺ said, I am telling you and no prophet before me told his people, is that he shall be born and one of his eyes is deformed. And guess what? That is not found in any of the Judeo-Christian folkloric tradition. Isn't that amazing? And this is a sign of Iman for us. Now, is it the right eye or the left eye? A huge controversy between our scholars, which is very little, yani, not much of a you know, fruitful discussion for us. Some ulama say, some ulama say, both of his eyes are going to be, because I'll tell you what is the issue. Once again, authentic hadith seem to, seem to potentially contradict. One hadith mentions his right eye will be like a grape. One hadith mentions left eye will be like fested, putrid. Does it mean that one of the narrators messed up and the Prophet either said right or left and then, or does it mean both eyes are messed up? Allah knows best. Allah knows best. Yani some ulama try to make jama' and they say, but it appears to me that Allah knows best that one eye is going to be uh, messed up and the other eye will be normal. So this is something the Prophet mentioned that the, the one of the eyes will appear like a, a, a rotten grape. So you know a grape that you leave it for a while, it pops open, there's a brownish area, disgusting to look at, that will be the eye of the Dajjal. So the Prophet is saying, recognize that man when you see him, there will be one eye that will be open and evil and putrid and festering and what disgusting, that is one of the signs of uh, the Dajjal. Another uh, sign is that the Dajjal will appear like a young man. So he's not going to be an old person. He will appear like a young man. Yeah, and he's 20, 30 years old. He's not going to be 50, 60, 70. His shakal, his facial features will be that of a young man. Another sign, the Prophet mentioned that the Dajjal will have curly hair. So he's not going to have straight hair. He's going to have curly hair. Okay? 
You don't need to look at your fellow friends and <laughs> measure him, what not. Calm down, bro. Bismillah. Let us pray none of your friends are Dajjal. Or else that makes you the supporter of Dajjal. So look at it that way. When you make fun of your friend as a potential Dajjal, you become the supporter of the potential Dajjal. So be careful who you make fun of. So another sign is that the hair is going to be curly. And one of the signs that we are all aware of, we are all aware of, the Prophet ﷺ said, every Muslim with an ounce of iman shall recognize the words kafir written on the forehead of Dajjal. Now, this sign is a sign of iman. It is not a physical sign because the kafir will see Dajjal and not see anything. Right? It is something that Allah will give to the believer. This is the eyes of the qalb, not the eyes of the heart, not the eyes of the, 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 the physical eyes. So the mu'min will see the Dajjal and will see written on him kafir. And then to emphasize the point, the Prophet spelled it out. Kafara will be written. Kafir will be written on his forehead. So this is something that is also authentically mentioned. As well, our Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that the Dajjal shall travel the whole world, will visit every city. Now, when, every, any, when something mentions in the Quran everything or every city or every issue, some people want to interpret this literally that every single small village shall be visited by Dajjal. We need to understand the word kullu in Arabic. We should know this as Arabic. The word kullu does not necessarily mean the English every. It can mean a lot of. It can mean a lot of. And it can mean every. You understand? So the word kul in Arabic does not necessarily mean every in English. It could also mean a lot of. And we know this from the Quran and Sunnah. Allah says in the Quran, to dammiru kull shay'in bi amri rabbiha. The wind of Thamud destroyed everything. But it's not everything. Did the wind that was sent to Thamud destroy the rest of the world? But Allah says, Kulla shay. So the word Kullu, and also, Woman Kulli Shayn Khalaqna Zawjaini. This is one of those things that, you know, if you log, you know, some people leave Islam, the Murtads, for the most trivial reasons, because their own ignorance doesn't understand the Quran. When they don't understand the Quran, they end up rejecting Islam. And I've read online one of the famous murtads who is rejecting Islam and making fun of it. He goes, look, the Quran says, وَمِن كُلِّ شَيْنْ خَلَقْنَا زَوْجَيْنْ And the amoeba is not zawjain. Because of this, it becomes kafir. And I say his mind is the size of an amoeba. That's why he became kafir. Doesn't know basic Arabic. When Allah says, وَمِن كُلِّ شَيْنْ خَلَقْنَا زَوْجَيْنْ it does not mean that every single species must be Zawjain. It could mean the default is Zawjain, and that is the reality. Doesn't mean that every single entity has to have Zawjain. You can have asexual reproduction which takes place in our world. See where I went from where to where, subhanAllah. Uh, we have five minutes left. Inshallah, we will continue this. Are there any quick questions? I apologize. I do apologize, actually, I'm uh, coming back from Hajj, so my mind is not fully... I have wandered today more than I typically do. So I apologize for that, but uh, my mind is not fully recovered. Make dua that, inshallah, we can get back on good health, so that I can, inshallah, get back on a more concise lecture. I was hoping to do double this amount today. We might have to have three lectures on Dajjal. I hope you guys don't mind, but we'll go into more detail, inshallah. So now we have a few minutes for Q&A before Salat al-Isha. Bismillah, yes. So this is a very good question by our brother that how if we say according to Sheikh Rashid Rida and others if we say that the hadith of Tamim al-Dari is not authentic how did it happen? Did the Sahaba astaghfirullah astaghfirullah mess up? We have to realize the average chain of narrators between Imam Muslim, Imam Bukhari and the Prophet is six people. Don't jump right at the Sahaba. 
There's plenty of people in the middle where, and this is actually well known for those who study hadith, sometimes the third, fourth narration, and this is very common, he might have heard something from someone, and when years go by, he assumes he heard it from a narrator of hadith, and he then projects it mistakenly. Mistakenly, he projects it to a hadith, and it's not a hadith. Okay? And this is the job of the more discerning scholars to sift through. And that's why I said, do we even want to open this door? And I said the majority did not open this door, which is why they considered the hadith of Tamim to be authentic. No, not about, no, you get, Umar bin Khattab was about Ibn Sayyad, not Tamim al-Dari. No, no, no. no. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anh, passed away very early on. We do not know how much he was monitoring Ibn al-Sayyad towards the end of his life. So Allah knows best. Umar ibn al-Khattab, he passed away as we know, يعني, you know, in the 12th year of the Hijrah, 13th year of the Hijrah. Ibn Sayyad lived many years after this. So he himself was unclear because he was unclear. His children, Hafsa and Umar ibn Umar were also unclear but the majority of tabi'un and later scholars realized and Ibn Taymiyyah and others mentioned this that there is no way that Ibn Sayyad could be the actual Dajjal and this doubt came because they witnessed him interacting with the Prophet Sallallahu so no doubt when they saw the evil that was in him so they have some doubt even Abu Sa'id al-Khudri we saw in his narration the rumors spread until the end of his life and even Abu Sa'id al-Khudri is like I don't know what to do with this guy so those things, we have to understand that the doubts of, of the Sahaba Ibn Sayyad were a temporary one because of that time frame. You understand what I'm saying here? Once situation goes on and it's clear that had he been that actual Dajjal, he wouldn't have done all that he had done. So then we can now verify and say he was not that big Dajjal, he was one of the minor Dajjals. Sisters, any questions? Back to the brothers, yes, Bismillah. Do we just mention? Oh, Ibn Sayyad, no, no, no. The Prophet did not see Ibn Sayyad having kafara on him. Also, Ibn Sayyad was a child in the time of the Prophet. And the doubt was is he going to grow up and become that Dajjal? Right? So, from the traditions we learn, that the Dajjal will grow up in a regular household and he will become Dajjal in a day. Like Hafsa said, something will happen to make him angry. Then something's going to happen and then he, the Dajjal will appear out. Before that, he's just an evil person. So this is the doubt. Was this Ibn Sayyad that evil person? No, the minor Dajjals are not going to have kafara and they're not going to have awar. No. Why did they think? But they were worried Ibn Sayyad might become the Dajjal. And when he becomes the Dajjal, Kafir will appear. When he becomes the Dajjal, all of the signs are going to come. They will show. That was the issue, okay? Final question, then we'll conclude. So, uh, if he's just a human, he's from Bani Adam, right? Dajjal? He is from the children of Adam, yes. Okay, so, um, how does he get the special, like, abilities that... This is the question of next week. Okay. Perfect question. It's a segue to next week. Our brother says, how... Does the Jal have the powers that he shall have? But we didn't mention any powers yet. Those powers will be mentioned next week, inshaAllah ta'ala. And on that Shahrazad cliffhanger note, inshaAllah ta'ala, we shall pause our lecture and then resume next Wednesday. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.